presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. Welcome Racecoin fans, I'm here with Xavier Manson, a Dutch professional GT race driver. Welcome to the show. Yeah, welcome. Good, good, good. Great to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, tell us about your journey, how you got started into motorsport um, and your career in Formula Ford. Um, I started actually quite late. My first time that I, uh, that I raced in a cart was when I was about 15 years old, which uh, was quite late. I mean, these guys start with six, seven years old already uh, karting uh, all the way. Um, so we did three years of karting in uh, Belgium and, and European championships. And after that, in 2001, um, yeah, we made the first step into Formula Ford. Uh, first, I did the Silverstone Racing School in England. Just to make sure, I mean, you can be quick in, in a car and in races, but it's uh, a, a car is a little bit different than a, than a cart. So uh, from there on, we, uh, yeah, we made the first steps and the Silverstone Racing School helped me a great deal, learned really the basics of racing and uh, all the things you need to know. And from there on, uh, we looked at the Formula Ford uh, Championship in the Benelux and as a preparation we did the, the formula Ford winter series which was great with a with like an old car that christian albers even used to race in in his days in formula ford so it was like a really old old car uh, but we did four races uh, four races in england um and it was uh, it was perfect we did brands hatch we did uh, donnington park we did uh, i think which one was it snetterton we drove so it was it was it was great we had a really a great time yeah, and how did, that's you, how, it all how did you get that those how did you get those opportunities to join formula ford and um just as a, a secondary question to that you also mentioned that there's slight differences between a car and a car so if you could go into that and tell us about what are the major yet yeah, slight differences yeah it all started my dad used to used to race in the past and he actually quit racing when i was born um but it was still tickling a little bit within my uncle. So they bought a cart and just went karting for the fun of it. And I started driving with that and that started like some fun and it went pretty well. And then we started to do one race just for fun, but I immediately won the race and it was really quick. So it just, it was like a, like a really small, like snowball effect. You know, it started really small, but once the snowball started running, uh, rolling, it was, it just got better and better. And, um, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, already in, in carts, my dad already sent me out to uh, to get sponsors and, you know, like with shaking knees, I went to my uncle to ask him for uh, 250 euros. And uh, that's how it all like started slowly. And we always, always were commercial and always worked with sponsors and always made deals with sponsors. So, uh, yeah, without sponsors in this world, there's uh, there's nothing that's going to happen, and especially the step to uh, to Formula Four it was a big one. Uh, but also there, my dad helped helped out with finding sponsors. He was commercially responsible within within his own company and had the time to uh, to assist me as well in it, which I'm really grateful for. So, how did you manage to get rid of those shaking knees and those nerves that you had when you you know first started to now dealing with sponsors probably on a daily basis? Well, yeah, I mean, you get used to it, really. Uh, the first time you you do something, it's really scary. But the second time you do it, it's less scary. And the third time you do it, it's even less scary. And you know, you get you kind of get the hang of it. Uh, obviously, when you get to like bigger companies and and for asking for for bigger bigger amounts of sponsorship or getting greater deals together, it's still uh, it's still well, it's still quite nervous. But it's still really cool, you know. Finding like a main sponsor gives you the same thrill as as sort of as winning a race. Sort of. <laughs> there was a yeah. bit of a retraction there. <laughs> I don't want to go too far. <laughs> but um, so, what kind of um, what what is a is a a good deal with a sponsor, for example? Like, what is the the best sort of outcome that you as a as a driver can expect to have? Uh, lots of money. That's for sure. No, I mean the bigger the bigger the deal, the better it gets. Um, but I think the best deals in a way for a driver is to get, uh, to get, to get value for a sponsor on exposure. Um, cause once, I mean, the exposure value of, of a sponsor on a car, if it's really big on a car is really valuable, but the cost that you have is quite small. Uh, we also have a lot of partners that focus on relationship marketing. So bringing their VIP guests to the racetrack. Uh, and that's really cool as well. And I really enjoyed having all these people over at the races and, and showing them around. Uh, but you have also the 
quite a big cost of uh, per person for inviting them as a VIP, uh, getting all the tickets, getting all the, the catering together. Um, so the exposure value is where you can create the most value for, as you for, for a racing driver, really. Um, but the, the value you create for a company is so much bigger than the cost that you have uh, out of pocket for it. And how do you manage to really, um, I mean, did you initially use your dad's relationships and his, his network to try to, um, you know, create your own and build up on that yourself? Or was that something you had to kind of venture out yourself to? No, I think, yeah, and for sure in, in the beginning, um, I was still doing my studies in international business at university. And my dad said, there's no racing without, uh, without doing your university, without getting your university degree, which I'm really grateful for because it sets you, puts you in a position where you uh, have a, back, a backup plan, sort of. Um, and I've learned a lot. I mean, I've wrote my, my, my thesis on, uh, on sport, sports sponsorship, so that helped. <laughs> uh, but no, in the be- I mean, in the beginning, yeah, for sure, it was my dad's network and, you know, a family. And my uncle had a company, so you went to go to ask him. And, um, and my dad used to do quite some work on sponsorship as well on, on people that he knew. Uh, so in the beginning, it was, it was, it was a bit maybe 70% his, his uh his work and 30% mine and that like over the years that evolved and it, I, I did more and more into it especially after 2007 when when I graduated from uh, from university I mean then I started to do everything full-time 100% and um, my dad started to uh, yeah to go a little bit more to the background and just enjoy the races yeah I mean that's awesome and he gets to just sit and now watch his son race right and you've also become a consciousness coach a keynote speaker a trainer you know you've got so many facets that you're kind of working on um where did uh, these other parts come into play into and get interwoven into racing um yeah I mean I've, I've as a race driver you always want to develop yourself and always want to be better than than the other drivers um and that starts on a physical level to be just fit but also to be mentally fit and that's uh how i came into contact with consciousness coaching um one actually it was the the owner of the of the gym that i that i went to uh, that i worked out with with my personal trainer that did a training a four-day training in in south africa and he got he got back from it and he was like so enthusiastic about it he said wow i know everything in my life like why i didn't do stuff why I did do make choices, where I was stopped, what my fears are, how like life works and how I relate in, in life and what my position is and what I really want from life. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds great. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> um, so uh, he, he got so enthusiastic about it that he actually took a franchise for, for the Netherlands. And uh, once he started the trainings in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, obviously I wanted to, to get in there to, to just – make myself better as a racing driver and uh that ended up like doing all the trainings because i got so enthusiastic about it as well as as he was uh learned so much about myself not only as a racing driver but also as a person um and uh well that ended up basically doing the full coach uh, training program uh, got a graduation as a coach i mean i'm you know I'm, once i do something i want to do it properly so i went to do it all and uh, in the beginning, I was I was not even interested in coaching other people. I was just interested in the self development of the program. Um, but once I got there and got to know, it's like, yeah, I can realize my own dreams of being a racing driver. But how cool is it to also to help others achieve their dreams uh, through the things that I do? And that's how I got even more involved and started the trainer program, um, and even got a trainer. So now I'm officially accredited, accredited uh, coach and trainer. Um, and it's, it's basically those two worlds together of, of consciousness, of everything that I've learned throughout these trainings and, and throughout my life, basically. Um, the things that I've learned in combination with the cool stories from racing that combine uh, the work I do as a, as a speaker, as a keynote speaker. So uh, I'm just not talking just about how cool it is to race cars, but also like a little bit about the background and how I got there. Uh, the choices that I made, the choices where I had fears in my life of what I was going to do, if I was going to make it, you know, it's stuff that everybody can relate to. But then, you know, you have motorsports, which has like, uh, yeah, the good listen vibe to it. Uh, it's, it's more, it's better than, than yeah, a, a desk job where you talk about the same struggles. But in, in my case, it's about racing cars, which makes it a little bit more, uh, 
yeah, interesting, I would say. Of course. And when did you first realize that you wanted to be a trainer? Was there a moment to it or was it just a kind of gradual feeling that started coming up because you started to improve yourself? No, it started gradually. As I said, in the beginning, I didn't even, I wasn't even interested in coaching. I just did the whole, uh, the whole training uh, just, just to, to improve myself, just to get better and better. And, uh, and once I was there, I was like, yeah, okay, then I want to graduate also as a coach and to get a, to get a degree as a coach. Uh, so I started coaching people and also saw the value in it and the fun that I had with it. Uh, and that's the same for, for the trainer. You know, they, they asked me to join the trainer team. It was like also a sort of development program. Um, and I learned so much from it. And on the other hand, I really enjoyed also, you know, connecting other people to their dreams and to the stuff that they really want to do in life. So the beauty of, or the irony of delusion is that you are always um, assuming that you don't have blinders on and you are not deluded because you are making the best decisions you know how. So how do you, in your keynote speaking or in training people or getting people to actually follow their dreams, how do you manage to get them to see what is their real truth and help them break free from a delusion when they don't even know that they're in a delusion and require or can benefit from the opening of their eyes? Yeah. I think you did some consciousness training as well. <laughs> <sort of here. laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm asking you, you're, you're the, you're, you're gonna... I know, but if, if I listen, you know, the, the, yes, we have a lot of blind spots in our life. Mm. And, and as a coach, as a trainer, it's, it's all about, you know, if it, especially on a one-to-one -one basis, it's all about the right question and the right question that, that makes you look further than everything you already know and everything you already see. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's all about the right question and that question for, to, for somebody else to see and for them to open up and see what is possible beyond what they think is possible. You know, what would you do without any fear? But yeah, okay, same, that opens like a whole box, you know. The same question can derive new results every time. So then yeah, it becomes a, a perspective of developing um, or digging deeper into oneself to try and realize what that really is. Now, yeah. how do you manage to actually get people to dig deeper within themselves when they think that they already know the answer? Uh, question after question after question. It's just, yeah, it's, it's as you said, it's, it's a matter of digging digging deeper and also as what, what I've learned is to really feel the person that you're talking to, just not just talking to them, but also connect with them and feel what there is and feel what they are saying, also feeling what they're not saying. Uh, because that's how you can, you know, find like where you can go deeper and get the results uh, out of them, which they didn't even expect were there. So can you give us an example of something that you've discovered about yourself that you didn't know that was um, something that was holding you back or something that was an issue in your life and prevented you from doing something? Well, I think one of the, one of the biggest things that I, that I talk about is um, when I was really young, I had, a, I had an older sister who was born with a, with a heart condition. Um, and my parents went to the hospital quite often to see her and finally she, she didn't make it and she passed away when I was eight years old. But what I learned from, from the situation is that when I went to school, you know, and my parents went to the hospital, I was with the neighbors, with my uncle and aunt, with my grandparents and unconsciously what happened inside of me was like, oh, my parents are choosing her over me. You know, just as, as a basic, it's, it was quite obvious he was in a hospital. But for me as an eight-year-old, I was like, hmm, they're choosing her over me. And what happened was, is you can either have two things. It's like, oh, everything I do doesn't matter, so I might as well just be a rebel. Or what I started to do was starting to prove that I was worth the attention. So I was really good at school. Uh, I was really good at sports. And in the end... I went to become a racing driver to just show the whole world like how good you are. Um, that's something I really learned and something especially that came out of it was when I had uh, in the past in, in, had a bad race or a race didn't go as I, as I wanted. Uh, I was like pissed off for two weeks. But what I saw like behind it was it was not that the race didn't well. It was just, huh, see, it was like an, a, um, 
an approval of no, you're approval, not good yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm um, sorry to hear about your sister. Um, you know, uh, that's tough for anyone. And um, I think that, you know, the the idea of trying to be someone who is always approval seeking is is a very tiresome journey. And naturally what that ends up is that you feel that life is just so difficult because you always have to try. And yeah. I'm sure now that you've gone through this sorts of things, um, possibly uh, your aims have changed or the views on life have changed. So how has that morphed and transformed over time now that you realize more about yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that, was, that was like real self-discovery. And it was like, you know, every time you could see and relate to yourself and become conscious of, oh, see, that's where I'm triggered of, see, you're not good enough. When a race went bad, when a deal with a sponsor didn't went through, um, well, if something went good, it was just like, yeah, normal. It's, you're good and everything's, everything's cool. Um, and what I've discovered and the learning out of it was now if I have a bad race, I know I've done everything in my power to, to get the best result out of it. I'm not going to be sick for like two weeks anymore. You know, I'm, as, as a sportsman, I'm still sick of not getting the maximum result about, you know, one or two days, but then I can start enjoying life again. And that was something that really transformed for me over like all the trainings and all the, yeah, the conscious development that I did to, to become a better person. You know, I was I, normally after a bad race, I was, I was just being an asshole for two weeks, basically. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stuff did that include? Um, just not getting out of the house, just hanging around, uh, being grumpy, especially being grumpy. But because it, it, and it just, it just triggers like, see, you're not good enough. Uh, and that's something like everybody. And that's what I've seen throughout those trainings as well. When I was a trainer, everybody has one of the core dramas. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth to be loved. Uh, we all have it. And it's just discovering which one is yours and becoming aware of it so that you can act differently on it. I mean, I can still, if I'm in a, if I'm in a fight with, with my, with my wife, I, I, I still feel the trigger. See, you're not good enough because she blames me for stuff, but it's how I react to it. That makes it, makes it different now. And, uh, yeah, gives me a better life. Yeah, of course. And, um, a much better life for many, many more moments because days, weeks, months don't go by where you're in this strut of, you know, life is just so annoying, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, actually able to just kind of get over it quicker so that you can enjoy it. But you still have the same triggers that come up. It's not like they, you're a different person as a result of it. It's just that you end up being able to deal with it more easily and in a way that allows you to just flow with things a lot more easily and kind of ride the wave out. I guess yeah. one of the things that um, naturally is a, is a question for a lot of people is that they want to drive themselves so that, you know, I want to be successful. And if I am a great racer, then I am successful. Like this, it was always an if then, right? So if yeah, I have yeah. this, then I will feel this, right? So how has your definition of success changed over time? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, for me, it was uh, when I really started, it, it was definitely an if then uh, situation. You know, if I arrive there, then, I, then I'm going to be happy or if I have that sponsored, then everything's going to be great. Um, and yeah, for me, I think the definition of, I mean, success is so, is so, it's so difficult to quantify in, in what is success. I mean, I had one of my friends got a presentation over saying, what is success? He said, yeah, I have a company with a big revenue, but two of my marriages blew up. And I, because I was working 80 hours a week. So what is success? Yeah, my company, you can call it a success. But if you relate it to my personal life, I screwed it up majorly because I wanted the success in the company. So success is for everybody, is for every person different. Um, and for, for me, it's just, you know, being able to do what I, what I love, what I love to do most um, and having that, having that freedom. And yeah, it is difficult sometimes and you don't always have the success you aim for, especially, I mean, in racing, the amount of races that you win is so much smaller than the amount of races that you don't win yeah. uh, in general. Um, and that's for every racer, even the most successful ones. Yeah. yeah. It's only about 13 to 15%, you know, typically speaking, and then you know, top races. Yeah, yeah then you're, then you're successful. <laughs> yeah, 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 literally, then you're successful. Yeah. But it only has to be 15% of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah. yeah so i mean yeah it um, it's just being a, being aware of it of i mean I'm just, i still aim to to get championships and get results and get get the things we want so i think it's it's uh it's also the nature of of where in the environment that we that we live in um but I'm, at least I'm, a, I'm like sometimes a bit conscious about how life is and can also enjoy just nothingness or just a walk or just looking, you know, looking at the trees or being in nature. And uh, that, I think that has changed, changed my life as well. I was, I was always like aiming for more and going for more and charging ahead. Um, but now I'm just happy with what is. That um, typically is always um, taken as a lot of fluff, a lot of woo-woo talk of just being happy with what is. All you got to do is just be aware, you know? It's like a very, um, it, it sounds very too easy, you know, because you are taught and driven in society, in media to strive, you know, be better than, you know, adverts these days are literally have what your friends don't have. You know, it is, it is permanently yeah. a, a struggle to uh, get something that you do not, possess right that is the only way the industry continues because that's the only way you can sell something um if you make people feel like they don't have something so what sort of myth would you try and uh, debunk about success now that you are in your own right successful because a lot of people for example like jim carrey right he's someone who talks about various things and you know has gone off in his own world in some respects people say but there is this idea that he says where I wish everyone could have millions of dollars so that they could realize that's not where the happiness lies. Now, yeah. how do you try and, um, as, as you know, what I'd like to ask you is how are you going to, or what kind of message would you say about um, busting the myth of success in general or related to any given thing like money? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, I mean, I could say I even struggle, struggle with it. Now, of course, I also want to possess a, not just racing Porsches on a track, but also to possess a Porsche on my driveway. Um, so yeah, we always strive for more. And I think it's, it's, for me, it's, it's finding the right balance, you know, of you could be happy with what is, and then you don't need anything. Uh, on the other hand, I also believe in, in the power of, you know, of, of aiming for for a goal to have something in perspective that you're going for because um, it makes you also charge ahead and go beyond what you think is possible for yourself and just yeah to, to try and achieve this goal uh, to achieve the the biggest to do the biggest races in the world and um, so it's yeah it's for me it's it's finding it's finding the the, the balance in between of not just always charging ahead and always wanting more but to be happy yeah just to be happy in with what is and at the same time to also have goals in life that charge you ahead that get you out of the comfort zone and just uh yeah to make it life a little bit more interesting so those goals that you spoke about um one of the key things about a goal is that typically um the goal is seen as the end line but there is always a for, you know, what is the goal for, you know? So for example, I want to be um, the best racer in the world, right? That's a goal, but yeah. for what, right? There is this kind of extension to it that needs to go beyond the goal itself. Do you see what I mean? Um, yeah. What would you say is your for each goal or a goal, for example, driving? All right. I've I've gone more into uh, which which was a video that usually inspired me was from Simon Sinek who says it's not what you do it's why you do it, um, and I really went deep like it took me like a couple of weeks before I started to realize like what's my why I do it because it's a, it's a great thrill of being a racing driver and enjoying racing cars and uh, the fun of sports and of competing against each other, uh, but my bigger why there were actually two that came out of it was one to share my passion of motors, motorsports and cars in general with other people. And was, and the other goal, the other why was why I do it is to show people that you can live your dreams because being a racing driver is, I mean, it wasn't naturally my childhood dream, but in general, it's, it's like a childhood dream to be a racing driver. Um, and for sure, it's not always the easiest path. I mean, I've done, an international business university study that 
could have got me in positions where I could have possessed more or haven't gotten more money. But it's about having that journey of being a racing driver and, and showing other people, yes, it is possible if you want to do it and you, I mean, you're willing to, to put things aside and really go for it. You can achieve any dream that you want. And that's, that's one of the things that is the deeper layer of yeah, why I do with my life what I do. So is that one of the reasons why you shifted to GT endurance racing? Was that because it you know, related more to the why or is that just the transition? Um, no, the, the switch to, to GTs was, I think, a, a natural transition. Um, when you start in racing, you start in karts. We all want to go to Formula One. I mean, I wanted to go to Formula One. Yeah, of um, I think I'm, I was happy to set out uh, two times, like, four-year plan together with my dad. He said, let's, let's get first uh, from, from karting to the start of racing and then have another four years to get into the top ladder of, of Formula Racing. Uh, and in 2007, I drove the World Series by Renault, which was, uh, well, I think as close as you can get to Formula One. We drove in, in the, in the pre-program in, in Monaco, which was one of those, you know, ticked boxes. <laughs> um, yep. And from there, I mean, from there, you have a good view on, on realistically if, if it is possible to get into Formula One and, and how much uh, sponsorship you would need. And I think I wasn't... I wasn't the, one of the best 20 drivers in the world uh, and I didn't have the budgets uh, necessary to make that next step again. Um, but I had some really good capabilities and the capabilities were actually came better to ride in, in, in endurance racing. Because um, sometimes in sprint races, which I do now with the Porsche Carrera Cup, and it's, it's exciting, uh, I'm, I'm sometimes, if you, engineers told me, you're too intelligent. You think too much. You know, in a sprint race, you just need to switch off and just go yeah. and just don't think about anything. Uh, while in sprint races, it was it was it was difficult and it was a disadvantage. I would say in endurance races, for sure, it's it's an advantage when you start to think and start to analyze and know when to pass somebody and when to actually uh, when to wait maybe one or two corners to pass a car. Uh, and I, I think in 24 hour races, especially it's an asset if you're, you have more capability of analyzing while you're racing. I mean, j uh, talking about Porsche, you know, three, a uh, few weeks ago, you had um, 35 clients just over one week um, where you were taking classes for them. Right. And what sort of um, experience is that when you're teaching and having clients um, and teaching them really the essence of what you've learned and trying to pass that on? What sort of um journey is that like what does it feel like how does it go and what makes that worth it well it's it's really it's really deeply connected to that why you know to share my passion about race cars and racing with other people so when we went to the porsche experience center in silverson i mean with 35 uh, entrepreneurs that just want to enjoy a day of being a child just racing porsches on on the track uh, but also when i like coach people that want to be want to get better in, in they already drive like a, a race car or a Cayman or a Porsche 911 Cup car to to be able to actually um, yeah teach people how to be better and and give them advice and tips. I mean, I, I just love to do it. It's it's all about sharing that same passion. You're you're surrounded with people that have that same passion, and you're just offering a gateway for them to to enjoy that. You know, to go to Silverstone and go. To, race Porsches a day or to go to spa and, and enjoy a day of racing on the track. I mean, it's, it's one of the things I, I really love and I make my living out of it. So what, what's even better than that? You know, it's for me, it's about organizing the event. Uh, people just pay the fee to, to join the event. So I make money out of it and I give them uh, a really cool day where they can uh, yeah, feel that passion that I have about cars and they enjoy themselves and they go away after a day with a big smile. I mean, yeah nothing's better than that right yeah, of course and on the topic of leaving people with a smile what message would you like to leave the fans that are listening um about what they can do in their lives to um as a coach or as a trainer in whatever aspect of life you feel like sharing the message achieve their dreams like you're trying to do through coaching well it's it's just about making that choices and daring daring to jump you know in one of my keynotes i have a little video of me doing a doing the James Bond uh, uh, 
uh, dive along that uh, along that cliff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. In uh, and it's it's about daring to make the jump. You know, it's especially because we got so so much like fears, like fears that maybe aren't even there but exist in your mind uh, that keep us from. From making steps and making making those dreams possible, even it's a, even if it's little dreams, you know. Um, yes, yeah, taking that fear under your arm and dare to jump. <laughs> I understand. No, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for being on the Racecoin podcast. Um, it's been awesome having you on. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, I didn't expect this conversation. I, sp- I expected it more to be about race cars. It was, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a little bit more deep, but yeah. Uh, anyway, it was uh, it was really cool. Yeah, I enjoyed it. If you like this episode of the Racecoin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.